there I am. Hope that's not too big a delay on the front end of this. Oh, well, we'll get through it one way or another. Uh, welcome to uh, back 1311. We're going to do chapter 14 today, which is on family systems. Uh, and uh, we are we have a whole class on family systems and how that uh, how uh, uh, important they are to the, to the substance abuse treatment field uh, and what roles family members play in, a, in an individual's recovery. Uh, but we're going to look at some theorists today, starting back with our old buddy Adler, whom we saw last in Chapter 5, and um, discuss uh, the, um, uh, how modern theorists kind of view uh, the family as being the patient again, rather than the individual. And so without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, you should be seeing uh, what I'm seeing. I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing, uh, which is uh, this, chapter 14. Let me go uh, back to uh, page 405 here right quick. Uh, it's 404. That's it. Uh, the seeds of the North American family therapy movement were planted in the 1940s, and that's uh, and actually even a little earlier than that because of Adler. And if you remember, Adler talked about uh, things like uh, uh, the family constellation, where there was a structure uh, to uh, to the family, uh, and that the people in it uh, existed basically in uh, predictable. Uh, relationships with one another, and you, if you knew the relationship, you could kind of predict what uh, was going to be happening next in the family. And uh, from that idea that all human beings' uh, behavior uh, occur in a context of one sort or another, uh, then uh, we begin to see another dynamic force uh, rising in um, uh, in uh, the counseling field, and that's the family systems movement. It is true, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, that a system is a, a, a collection of things, of entities, of uh, individuals, of interactions, of rules, of uh, whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, for human beings, our behavior is almost always best explained with the idea of um, context. You, there's an old story that used to go about AA that uh, talked about fishermen. And uh, one day on the back of the boat, uh, there's a school of uh, King Mackerel behind the boat and uh, the, cap, the skipper of the boat drags a lure uh, through that school of fish, and one of them grabs it. And the minute he grabs that hook and feels that hook, he starts acting like King, uh, King Mackerel has never acted before. He's running from side to side. He's diving. He's jumping out of the water. He's trying to go a double back. Uh, and struggling, uh, uh, you know, uh, with all his might against this hook that he's uh, found himself uh, attached to. All the other fish in the school initially freak out a little bit, and they swim away uh, from uh, the individual who's struggling. Uh, but then they come back and look at him, like, you know, what the hell's going on with Billy? He was, he was okay this morning. Uh, and the moral of the story is that uh, the context of that, uh, uh, of that fish is that he's no longer a free fish. He's on a line and he's hooked. And it is extremely difficult for the unhooked fish to understand the behavior of the hooked one. And if you understand uh, what he's struggling against and how he's struggling and what it means to lose, then that behavior takes on a whole new context. A family systems perspective holds that individuals are best understood through assessing the interaction between and among family members. 
because the development and behavior of one family member is inextricably interconnected with others in the family. And we're going to talk about some uh, theorists who, uh, who, who spoke to that reality here in just a little bit. Uh, you understand the relationships in a family if you understand the rules of the family, if you understand uh, the roles in the family that people play. So there is a, uh, individual dynamics are important, but collective dynamics are equally important, uh, especially for people who are doing things like we're doing, uh, the uh, substance abuse counseling work. Uh, once upon a time, we used to take people out of their, uh, out of their uh, systems and send them away to Good Place Treatment Center, and we give them all kinds of good skills that they can take home with them and things like that. Uh, to stay sober and never have a problem again, right? Except uh, when we send them back to their families, uh, they're not prepared to be in that environment anymore. Uh, the, the way they behave has changed. So they're really kind of an unknown quantity to the people that they live with. Uh, and generally speaking, what happens if you send someone uh, back to counseling or back to their family out of counseling and, and there hasn't been any uh, there hasn't been any uh, change or treatment happening with family members that probably what will happen is they won't know how to deal with this new person that lands among them. He's now a, 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 a square peg uh, where there's a bunch of round holes and he doesn't fit in anymore. So what is likely to happen is if he wants to stay clean, he may have to leave the system. He may have to get out of it for a while, maybe forever. I don't know. Uh, but uh, not everyone is prepared to do that. Uh, and it's not the best move for everyone either. Or he has to learn to, uh, uh, to maintain his sobriety goals, his recovery goals, to do the things that got him to where he is now, to keep doing those in spite of his family, or he'll have to uh, uh, let go of all that and transition back into the role that he held in the family prior to treatment. Uh, and uh, sometimes the family sabotage uh, recovery. Now, I want to go on record here uh, as saying, I, I'm not saying yes because I think family members are evil individuals who are out to get to uh, uh, their uh, identified uh, chemically dependent person and, uh, uh, you know, cause them to relapse. But uh, that's what happens a lot of the time. Context again. When we send people out of treatment, they have to go back to work. And at work, they're going to find their friends, people that they work with, colleagues, maybe friends that they drink with, or back to school, their friends that they got high with or uh, back into the neighborhood uh, where everybody barbecues and drinks a lot of beer on a Sunday. Uh, you know, so uh, they're going to have to have some adaptive skills to help them um, uh, function and thrive in this system uh, or, um, or, they won't be able to, uh, or they won't be able to stay clean. The context. Systemic therapists do not deny the importance of the individual in the family system, but they do believe that an individual's systemic affiliation and interactions have more power uh, than a single therapist could ever hope to have. We will never have the influence on them as counselors uh, that the family does. Uh, and if you have, uh, uh, for Bowen and for, uh, and for uh, Jackson and uh, some of the others that come along later, uh, who view uh, the system itself as the client, uh, then, um, you know, it's expected uh, that they will have, uh, that they've tried to solve their problems on their own. They've tried to help people get over their drinking, get over their drugging, get over their depression, get over their gambling, whatever it is that's going on with them. Uh, and they've tried to do this on their own, and uh, they failed. Most families have tried bargaining, threatening, all kinds of things before uh, uh, their family member ever gets to us for the, uh, for the interventions that we bring about. 
Uh, and unless something changes at home, then uh, the the new uh, newly sober person won't know how to uh, to behave. It's important for us to note at this point that some families are crisis oriented. That's very common with substance abuse um, uh, disordered systems. It seems we have to have someone in our system to be a screw up, and they have to be that screw up consistently for us because that's how we function as a system. Some terminologies that's thrown around a lot when you when you hear people talking about families and systems are functional and dysfunctional. Well, there, there's no such thing as an optimally functioning uh, family. I mean, you know, even Lassie gets fleas from time to time. Uh, so all families have problems. All of them uh, fall short, uh, perhaps desired goals or, or desired types of behaviors, however you want to express that in a system. Uh, so a, a functional family does not have to be perfect, and a functional family has got dysfunction in it. Uh, it just does. Also, there's no such thing as a totally dysfunctional family. Actually, what we're looking at is more functional, less functional, and it's probably better if we refer to it as an imbalanced family rather than a dysfunctional family because um, of the implications of that terminology. Uh, telling someone, well, your system's dysfunctional it can be very disheartening for them, you know? Uh, but uh, uh, why is it, do you think, that a woman who has suffered at the hands of a batterer uh, and gets out of that uh, uh, system uh, will hook up with another batterer? Why is it, do you think, that someone who was molested as a child hooks up with someone who will molest their children? Uh, there's some pretty strong stuff going on in there. And remember, uh, it's, it's what we're familiar with. And think about the root word of that term, familiar, family, are, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, what we're used to, what we know how to do. And people who come up in dysfunctional systems or imbalanced systems, uh, they adapt behaviors, and these are known as survival roles that they use uh, to, uh, to make it uh, through that system. And uh, one of the things that we'll uh, see uh, with people who uh, are doing that is that um, uh, they, they, take, they take behavior that worked fine in their family of origin, uh, and then they take them out of the family of origin and try to apply them in other systems, and they don't work so well because it's not the same model. And there are lots of models of, uh, of imbalanced families that we can talk about and we may talk about here as a matter of fact. Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers and their associates were the first known practitioners of family therapy and they often used a model called open forum family counseling and that's where uh, uh, you know people get together family members, and that we, we still do that today. We still have open forum family counseling, and we have um, uh, Adler's Phenomenology. We pay attention to that. Uh, if you're in a system, your perspective of how that system works is very important. Your perspective of what life is like there is very important and phenomenological. So it's important for us to understand, uh, understand that with our clients. Uh, consequently, assessment is based on subjective uh, descriptions that family members use to define themselves. I don't know if it's, uh, I really don't know if it's particularly unique to American culture or if this is this way all over the planet, uh, but uh, when I talk to uh, individuals about their families and things and I ask them, you know, stuff about, well, you know, when you were growing up, was your father a drinker or your mother? You, you have a history of substance uh, abuse um, or dependency in your family. Uh, and people will get a little bit defensive and say, well, you know, my dad drank a lot when I was a kid, but I, I'm not prepared to say he was an alcoholic. I couldn't do that. I'm, you know, I'm not a counselor or, or whatever. Uh, to which I usually respond, well, you know, this, uh, I, I'm talking about something that may be helpful just for you. It, uh, 
uh, and uh, whether he, you know, whether we could diagnose your father as an alcoholic or not, it's really beside the point. Is how you viewed him at the time and how you view him now, and if his drinking uh, uh, hurt your relationships any. Uh, and uh, uh, talking about family and talking about things like drinking, violence, sexual acting out, uh, uh, in, including molestations and child rape and things like that is, um, you know, that's kind of taboo. Uh, people don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's kind of difficult to get uh, the information that we need to have a clear uh, uh, assessment of uh, what, what family life was uh, about. So we do the best that we can with it. And it's subject to being modified. Uh, and, I, and I say this because when we first see a person, maybe the first couple of times or three times that this individual's in our office with us, spending time with us, uh, then, um, you know, we're getting to know them. And as we get to know them, uh, uh, they divulge a little more and a little more and a little more uh, until, uh, uh, you know, they they. they are pretty sure they can trust us with their deepest, darkest family secrets. And some of them are pretty deep and dark. Uh, and others are known to everyone, and the family just doesn't know it. The um, Some of the stuff that we ask people to do in terms of setting boundaries in systems, setting boundaries with other people, knowing where I stop and you start, that kind of thing, uh, feels... Uh, feels uh, not right to our clients. Uh, it feels like we're asking them to abandon their families or to not help their family members. Uh, and we're not. What we're doing is, is helping them to set new limits and, that they can stick by and uh, to develop new behaviors that's more adaptive to them than the, than the old uh, behaviors. And sometimes that gets them slapped down. In uh, your family class that you'll be taking, uh, maybe some of you've had it already, you might have been tasked to do a genogram. And a genogram is included in this course room for this lecture, by the way, and a, and a discussion of genograms and what they are and how they work. Uh, but uh, uh, I've had students who've gotten into that and they want to be sure that they're, you know, covering all the bases and getting all the information that they need and presenting it in the right way and all this cool stuff. Uh, so they want to go ask Aunt Agnes or, or, or Uncle Harry or, uh, or Grandmom about, you know, the family. And uh, when you start asking these questions of your family members, if you were to do that, you have to be aware that uh, uh, chances are pretty good they won't appreciate it. <laughs> I've had students come back to me and say, uh, and, they're, and say, well, I asked grandmother about this, and she said, what's that man need to know this for? It's none of his damn business. And th th they're right. It is none of my damn business. It's not for me. It's for the, f for the student. It's for the individual doing the genogram to understand uh, what happens uh, in a family. One of the things uh, that I uh, uh, talked about in, uh, in the genogram presentation, and you'll, you can flip over and look at it, but I'll, I'm going to duplicate it in this lecture too, is the old story about the little girl who was watching her mother uh, getting ready to do a Thanksgiving Day feast, and she was making a ham, and she took the ham and set it on the cutting board and cut the ends off of the ham, off each end, uh, and set them off to the side. Then she put her garnish and everything that she's going to serve with the ham, the, uh, the glaze that she put on it, uh, and slid it into the oven, which was preheated to a certain degree, uh, and stepped back and, uh, you know, wiped her hands on her apron and felt pretty satisfied about it until the little girl said, Mama, why, why, why do we cut the ends off of the ham before we cook it? And Mama said, well, that's just the way you cook a ham, baby. You cut the ends off of it, and you put all of your glaze and your garnish and everything you're going to put on it, and you preheat the oven to this degree, and you put it in there and let it cook for an hour or so. Uh, that's how you cook a ham, and you take the ends and put them in the beans. 
And the little girl said, oh, okay. And she burned off. Uh, but now her mom was worried about this. Why do we cut the ends off of the ham before we do that? Uh, and she uh, called her mother up and said, Mom, why, why do we cut the ends off the ham when, when we're cooking it, when we're cooking it in the oven? And her mother said, well, that's the way you cook ham, baby. You cut the ends off the ham and you set them aside so you can use them in the beans. And uh, uh, then you put your glaze and your garnish and everything on there, preheat your oven to this degree and put it in, and that's how you cook ham. And uh, she said, oh, okay, good daughter. Uh, but now uh, her mom was worried. So she went and called great-grandma, who was down at the nursing home, uh, and she said, Ma, why do we cut the ends off the ham when we make ham? Uh, you know, and her mother said, habit. Uh, when I married your dad, we didn't have a pot big enough to cook a ham in, so I had to cut the ends off of it. Uh, and so four generations later, people are still cutting the ends off of the ham. This thing that began uh, historically back there several generations back had a purpose at that time. There was a reason for doing it this way at that time. But playing it forward uh, four generations, uh, that behavior is still being engaged in, but with no reason whatsoever. Does that make sense? Of course it doesn't. <laughs> It does, but uh, I, I can follow that. I get it, uh, but uh, uh, I, I would like to see someone follow up on that story to see if the little girl, when she grows up, if she's still cutting ends off of him, uh, because at some point, if we want this kind of traditional behavior that seems almost genetic to stop, like drug abuse, uh, uh, alcoholism, sexual violence, etc., that's going on in the system, someone at some point has to behave in a different manner. They have to find a way to stop it, to uh, uh, break the cycle of addiction, so to speak, and drinking and what have you. This old chap is Murray Bowen. Uh, he believed that three generations was the best way to understand a family. You analyze three generations of them, uh, and patterns of interpersonal relationships connect family members across generations. We uh, do things the same way uh, that uh, our um, uh, elders did. One of the biggest wastes of breath I've ever heard in my life is when someone tells you, do as I say and not as I do, uh, and you're a child. Because children do not do as parents say, they do as parents do because they watch us and uh, emulate us. That's part of the way human beings learn to be human beings. Uh, that can be problematic uh, if uh, they're watching us stay drunk uh, every minute that we're at home, of uh, having real loud arguments, throwing things, breaking things, slapping each other around, that kind of thing. Uh, and People who grow up in that system are not prepared to have healthy relationships. It's, uh, it's a hard road to hoe, as my uncle would say. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bowen says that, uh, uh, and he's right about this, is that uh, we have to understand uh, where this comes from, how it manifests itself, and what people are trying to uh, accomplish by this. And generally, the accomplishment is trying to fit in. It, this is an adaptive strategy. And the reason people keep uh, engaging in an adaptive strategy, even one that's not satisfying, is because they don't know how to do it otherwise. So that a big uh, chore for anyone who's working uh, with, a, with a family is to help them discover, if you will, a more adaptive way uh, of living so that they won't have to keep doing this over and over again. Uh, and that's uh, Murray Bowen. Uh, so he has multi-generational uh, therapy that he uh, brings to the table. Virginia Satir uh, developed conjoint family therapy and, uh, as a human validation process model so that we get several families, family members together uh, and emphasize communication and emotional uh, experiences. 
she uses an intergenerational model too, uh, but uh, uh, she also used family sculpting, sculpting, which is an excellent illustration uh, of uh, of uh, uh, family roles, and you may get an opportunity to participate in that uh, from time to time when you uh, get out there in the world and start working. Uh, uh, for her, relationships are the most important thing. Uh, and one of the things that I think uh, a lot of uh, students uh, leaving classes and, uh, you know, re and going out into the real world, so to speak, or even students who have been working, you know, uh, with conjoint therapy, uh, for instance, in, uh, at, at their practicum sites, uh, are shocked sometimes because it's real easy for us to get sucked back into playing a role in that system. Uh, and if that happens to you, don't beat yourself up about it, uh, which is what most of us have a tendency to want to do. Uh, how the hell did that happen to me? I was being a good counselor. Next thing I know, I'm, you know, in here taking sides and all of this stuff. Uh, well, that's how dysfunctional systems work. That's how imbalanced systems work. And if you come from one, you're familiar with this behavior. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robin Norwood, back in the 80s, wrote a book called Women Who Love Too Much. And uh, she uh, describes uh, a discussion she had with one of her clients, a lady who... Uh, 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 said to her, uh, Dr. Norwood, why is it that every guy I'm ever attracted to turns out to be an asshole? Uh, quote, by the way. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, doctor said back to her, well, you know, you're kind of on the right track with that questioning, you know, but you need to take it a little further. The real important question for you, my dear, is why are you only attracted to assholes? And when, you got the, and when you have the answer to that, you can do something about it. And as long as you don't have the answer, you can't. Uh, Dr. Norwood described relationships with people who come from imbalanced systems as a kind of a dance. We want to dance with people who know the same dance as we do. Uh, people who can lead us or be led by us through the steps that we're both familiar with people who hear the same music we hear. Uh, and that is where we're comfortable. And we do this dance over and over until it's very uh, automatic to us. Uh, so what's being asked, uh, particularly with systems theories uh, and systems approaches, is that we change the, change the music and the step. And that can be very uncomfortable uh, for people who are uh, engaged in that. This is Dr. Satir here. Looks like she's having fun, huh? Uh, anyway, uh, there are alliances in a family, uh, and uh, we have to recognize the alliances and how things work in a, in a, in a, in a, in a system. Uh, if you imagine that uh, we're in a dysfunctional system, it's got a very strong outer boundary, uh, and one of the ways that we... Uh, uh, create that boundary and use it for safety is that everyone inside the us's know that you don't share our business with the thems and they're the ones that are outside that uh, family. So we don't air our dirty laundry and we don't go to other people and let them see that we're having problems. We don't take kindly to the interference uh, of strangers, etc. In that system, uh, even though we have a strong outer boundary against the rest of the world, against the thems that are out there, we don't have much in the way of boundaries on the inside, uh, so that I can't really tell where I stop and you start. I feel responsible for things I shouldn't be responsible for. How you feel, for instance, that's not my call, and it's not in my power to, uh, uh, you know, to, to rescue you from bad feelings or what have you. Uh, but uh, Mnuchin says, if you uh, look at the structure, families are organized primarily hierarchically. Uh, if you think about the, uh, the, the, uh, the vaunted uh, uh, typical American family, I don't think there is such a thing. 
but uh, let's just for the sake of argument say there is. And this typical American family has a mom and dad at the top, and dad goes to work, and mom stays home and takes care of the kids. And we got uh, the children in the family. We got the oldest next to the oldest, uh, next to the youngest and youngest. It's got four kids in there, right? Uh, and uh, uh, if there's strife in that system, if mom gets into a fight with dad, uh, the kids are not allowed to be neutral, you know? If the kids get in a fight with each other, the parents aren't allowed to be neutral. You, if there's a fight inside that system, you will pick a side or one will be assigned to you. You are not Switzerland. <laughs> you know, you're going to be involved one way or another. Uh, and uh, that's how we expect things to be on the outside as well when we go and start uh, uh, creating our own families. We want to find someone who can operate within that system that we're familiar with. Uh, <clears throat> It, that, that can lead to some real heavy conflict in a relationship when there are expectations. <clears throat> As a male, uh, people seem to think I have a genetic uh, ability, a born-in uh, <clears throat> ability to fix stuff. I am the unhandiest guy you've ever seen in your life. In fact, mean old Janice here at home pushes me out of the way and does home repairs and stuff because I'll mess it up and then we'll have to call a professional. But anyway, uh, the uh, uh, you know maybe I expect uh, uh, my wife uh, to take care of me the way my mother did or the way my mother took care of my father. Uh, uh, women do the cooking, women do the laundry, etc. and so forth. And that's as unrealistic a, a, a belief. Uh, uh, going into a, a relationship as the belief that uh, because I have uh, the, the right chromosomes lining up, I can, you know, rebuild a tranny or something. I can't. Uh, so when you look at, at the structural system, you're really looking at power and how power is deployed. And some problems really exist in, uh, in uh, uh, the imbalanced system. Uh, because if we're going to reduce the, the, the symptoms of dysfunction that are going on in the system, we have to look at who makes the rules, who, you know, who does the punishing, who sets the, uh, the boundaries, etc. And we have, to be, uh, bring, uh, uh, we have to bring about structural change. And the way you do that within a system is by modifying transactional rules. Who gets to say what? Who gets to feel what? Etc. Some of you, I know, are in recovery, and you probably heard uh, in in that milieu that uh, if you come up in, in a, 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 an imbalance of dysfunctional system, then rules govern your ability to function within that system. And uh, the three big rules in that system is don't trust, don't talk, don't feel. Uh, you can't trust people. They're too inconsistent. Your parents are inconsistent. So they, uh, you know, they ground you unreasonably one day and give you $20 and the keys to the car the next day. And you haven't done a damn thing differently. It's about them being different from day to day and being inconsistent from day to day. Uh, and if you're 12 years old with a $20 bill and the car keys, you're confused. Uh, the interventions that are generated in uh, str uh, structural strategic uh, approaches uh, include joining, uh, boundary setting, unbalancing, reframing, ordeals, paradoxical interventions, and enactments. Uh, these are all basically gestalt uh, uh, techniques that you, uh, that you do. You can divide your family into subsystems. Again, this is a, a, about power. Uh, the family that you're born into is your family of origin. Uh, and so uh, that consists of your parents and your siblings. Uh, within uh, that uh, uh, family of origin, you are a member 
of the sibling subset. So you're on a level with brothers and sisters. And there's a power structure to that, too. Usually most of the power in the sibling subset resting uh, with the oldest, biggest, most violent, whatever, you know. Uh, you grow up, you, get, you leave home, you find someone that you love out there or someone that, uh, you know, you can tolerate. <laughs> I don't know how it works for everyone. But, uh, and when we, when we do that, uh, we start uh, uh, our own family. We start our own relationships there. And, um, and th that it becomes the marital subset. That marital subset consists of husband and wife. A healthy marital subset uh, uh, consists of husbands and wife. It gets unhealthy when we start to triangulate people into it, like mother-in-laws, father-in-laws, and children. Uh, aunts and uncles who get involved in the, uh, the relationship. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, um, combinations of relationships that can uh, muddy the water with that. Uh, so uh, the marital subset uh, consists of a couple uh, under optimum circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, our... Uh, in-laws are, uh, you know, kicked to the curb and don't have any input on anything that we do or anything. It's just that, uh, you know, the main uh, relationship in that is between the boy and the girl, or the girl and the girl, or the boy and the boy, or any combination thereof. But that's how that uh, parental, uh, how that marital subset works. When children come along, whether they're born to us or uh, uh, left to us, a lot of uh, 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 grandparents in our society today are uh, raising their grandchildren as if they were uh, their children because someone has to do it. Uh, and uh, uh, I know that that's, uh, that's a difficult thing for some of us. It's a difficult thing for all of us. We're, you know, uh, grandkids are better when you can have them for a little while and then give them back to mama. Uh, they're more fun that way. Uh, but uh, if you have them full time and there's no mom or dad on the scene, it can, it can be challenging. So in any case, uh, the, uh, the parental subset uh, comes in when we have the marital subset plus kids, and they can be adopted kids, kids that are born to the couple, uh, uh, grandkids, uh, you know, uh, nephews, nieces, however you wind up with them. If you're, if you're, it's about fulfilling a parental role with these kids. Uh, and then there's the sibling subset. Uh, and each of these, uh, you know, when you think about it in terms of human identity of who, who I am, uh, when, I, when I talk to you uh, and I tell you, uh, you know, that I'm an alcoholic, that's true. It's part of who I am, but it's not all that I am. There's a lot more to me than just that behavior, just that condition. Uh, when I tell you I'm a husband, that implies something, and it implies that I have a wife, and I do. Uh, if I tell you I'm a father, that implies something. It implies that I have children, and I do. And if I tell you I'm a grandfather, it implies that I have grandchildren, and I do. And if I'm a son, I have parents. And if I'm a brother, I have siblings and all of that good stuff. I, I also fit into a subgroup that there is no name for. Uh, if I lose my parents, I'm an orphan. If I lose my wife, I'm a widow. Uh, but if I lose my son, what am I now? If I lose my child. Uh, and that's um, a very sad little subset to be into. And there is no name for us as... Uh, a character in Six Feet Under, uh, Brenda Chenoweth said, that's so effing awful that they don't even have a name for it, <laughs> you know, and that's, uh, and that's the truth. Uh, so uh, the notion of uh, relationship and connection is not just something that we, uh, it's not an abstraction, it's a reality for, uh, uh, for human beings. Postmodern approaches, uh, feminist, uh, uh, let me say something because we skipped over the chapter on uh, 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 feminism and I, I, I 
probably will like to say something about that if we have time this semester. But um, the feminist, multicultural, and postmodern therapists are uh, extremely aware of the power they have entering into already established systems. And so they try to promote understanding through curiosity and interest rather than through formal assessments. Uh, if you adopt a decentralized position, a decentered position, uh, you can become a part of that system without taking it over. However, uh, you, uh, you know, able to do that, you have to be very, very aware of your own reactions and behaviors in that because you can be, as I said a while ago, sucked into role behavior before you know what hits you. Uh, Postmodern approaches to family therapy uh, seek to reduce or eliminate uh, the power of the therapist and to increase the, the, the power and the options of uh, uh, family members. And um, so, uh, if you look at the, at the various systems viewpoints, you'll see that a lot of that uh, uh, each of them takes a different approach to uh, to working with the family. Uh, which approach is the best? Uh, I guess the one that you have that you're using now. Uh, it, it's it's hard to say that this is better than that and this is better than that because all of them uh, serve a purpose and all of them uh, are successful and unsuccessful. In, in ways. Uh, so uh, when you start looking at a family, no matter which approach you're going to take or how you're going to do it, you're going to have issues of boundaries. Where do I stop? And you begin. You're going to have issues of setting those boundaries, you know. Uh, and there are, th and we, uh, uh, families are a real source of guilt and shame and all kinds of bad things for people but they're also sources of pride and integrity and these types of things in uh, uh, people too. Uh, so uh, when you coming out of your family system, you bring the good, the bad, and the ugly with you, uh, so to speak. To understand that process and what it is, uh, is a good idea to look at multi-layered process of family therapy. Uh, in your genogram projects uh, that you're going to be required to do for the family uh, class, then uh, uh, you're looking uh, for patterns of behavior that run through the family. But you're also looking for things like illness. Uh, I discovered in my family that there's a whole bunch of chemical dependency of, to all kinds of things, to uh, prescription medications, tobacco products, alcohol, other type drugs, uh, uh, you know, and a whole bunch of things. Uh, the family roles, when I, when I first heard about them, and this was Virginia Satir who came up with those and uh, 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 began the study on that, uh, but uh, uh, these are behaviors. They, this really doesn't describe people as much as it describes the behavior. Uh, going back to Adler, he came up with the birth order characteristics. Y'all remember that? The oldest child is like this. The second oldest has characteristics like this. The third oldest this. The fourth oldest that. And uh, after you get up to, uh, to four, you start over again. <laughs> you know? So if you got more people, then there you go. Uh, but um, the... Uh, 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 the roles that we engage in, the behavior that we go go into, are are, are roles that uh, uh, that serve the system. In other words, you can have a systemic uh, uh, there, uh, certain behavior has a systemic adaptability that keeps the system running, but it's awfully hard on the individual who's in that role. Uh, You'll see in the other slide presentation uh, that there are uh, uh, the identified chemi chemically dependent person in a family system, uh, the chief enabler, usually the spouse, that's a role, uh, the hero child, usually the oldest, uh, the uh, uh, mascot or, uh, I mean, the, uh, the scapegoat uh, will be in there. That, child serves a, a, an adaptive purpose. 
the lost child, and the mascot. Uh, and so each of these roles consists of a certain type of behavior. The main uh, triumvirate uh, triad in an in a imbalanced system is a mother, father, and a child who's been triangulated into the marital and parental relationship. And what I mean that is that, say, the oldest child, the hero child, this is a child who brings a sense of worth to the family, right? And this hero child, uh, uh, you know, makes good grades in school, helps with the kids, uh, you know, makes sure that they're fed and bathed and put to bed on time and all of that good stuff. Uh, they get a lot of positive feedback, uh, you know. Look at Alice. She's such a blessing to her mother, you know. She just does all this wonderful stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so they get a lot of atta girls or atta boys from that. Uh, but they're put in untenable situations. Maybe Alice is sitting uh, there uh, listening to her mother complain about her sexual dissatisfaction with her father. That is no place for a 13 year old to find herself or listen to dad's dissatisfaction with mother and how much he hates her now and, you know, what a bitch she is and all this good stuff. That's no place for this little girl uh, uh, to be placed, no matter how it benefits the system. Make sense? Uh, so uh, this triad, the, 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 the hero child is helping hold the marital relationship together. She's also fulfilling a lot of the duties in the parental relationship with taking care of her younger siblings that mom and dad should be doing. Mom may be abandoning the kids because she's tired uh, because uh, she started abusing drugs or something along those lines, taking too many nerve pills, mother's little helpers. Uh, and uh, dad may be abandoning the kids because he's working all hours, and when he's not working, he's drunk. Uh, he's never there for them. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the older child who's drawn up into this triangulation uh, has to carry a lot of the burden. And pays a heavy price for it emotionally. Imagine then uh, that the pressure in this triangle, triangle this three-way relationship of, uh, of uh, a three-way marriage, a three-way parental agreement, uh, there's a, it could blow up. Uh, and where would that leave the rest of the family? Where would that leave the three that... Uh, are, uh, are in the families, uh, are in the triad. Well, we have pressure release valves. They used to call them pop-off valves out in the plant. That when pressure builds so high up in the piping system, then the diaphragm blows on a pop-off valve and it will cause the floor to shake and you'll hear a loud bang and then a high-pitched scream as the, uh, as the pressure bleeds off and it will scare the living Jesus out of you, but it keeps the plant from blowing up. It has, uh, 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 and of course that's it for the pop-off valve. It'll have to be changed out because it blew itself up, <laughs> you know, keeping the, uh, keeping the uh, 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 pressure from destroying the rest of the piping uh, system. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you the escape note. Uh, this is the one who is blamed for everything in the family. Why can't you be like your sister, Alice? Damn it, Billy, are you ever going to straighten up? Uh, you know, why are you hanging out with your punk friends? Are you smoking that wacky tobacco again? You know, uh, your dad wouldn't drink so much, you know, if, uh, if, if you were a better kid. You cause him so much stress, he just has to. Your mother would uh, not be as nervous as she is and as ill as she is if you had straightened up. You, you're, you're just putting a strain on them. Uh, so they get a lot of bony fingering, you know, uh, to, uh, with people. Um, don't guess you need to see that one. I'm talking about. get a lot of bony fingering. I was pointing at the screen and you couldn't see it. Uh, you know, you rotten kid. It's all your fault. You rotten kid. You rotten kid. Uh, and uh, this is not a happy place for Billy to be. Uh, it's not a role that he uh, sought out, that uh, he thought, well, you know, my family needs someone to blame, so I'll, I'll let it be me. Uh, 
when the family needs something, needs a role behavior, people are kind of sucked into it, kind of drafted into it. Uh, and the hero child, uh, depending on what they do, can go from being, you know, way up here on a pedestal to way down there on the bottom of someone's shoe. Uh, and uh, uh, as a friend of mine once said, one oh shit and all your atta girls go out the window. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's true too. There are mercurial changes in relationships in a family that's, uh, uh, that's out of balance and it can get real heavy real fast for, uh, uh, for the members. But uh, even though it's costing that, uh, that child in terms of self-esteem, self-satisfaction, they're always angry, and the, all of that anger always comes from hurt. Uh, you know, other family members, uh, uh, you know, brothers, sisters, cousins, they're, you know, you're, you're, you're the bad kid. You're, you're trouble. We don't want to be around you uh, kind of thing, and uh, it, it weighs on them. It costs them. Uh, to do that. But the purpose that they serve is they keep this whole other imbalanced system from going bluey when the pressure gets too high. Sometimes that, uh, uh, that uh, scapegoat kid can go too far and wind up going to jail or something. And that's when we can call on the other role members. Uh, there's a, a, another pressure relief valve uh, waiting in the wings, and that's the lost child. And lost children are very mediocre people by, by, um, uh, by any standards, you know. Uh, and these are not empirical, by the way. I'm not saying that uh, you could diagnose people as being a lost child or something like that. These are just categorical ways of thinking about uh, a system and a deployment of power uh, throughout that system. So that a lost child doesn't engage uh, with people much. Uh, remember that, don't trust, don't talk, don't feel. But uh, lost children are very good at practicing that. How are you doing? Okay. You know, uh, they're that person that was sitting in your classroom one day uh, and they just didn't show up. And for a while you noticed the chair was empty. And then a while later you're like, who was there? <laughs> you know, who was there anyway? Uh, and they're a spare part. Uh, they help relieve pressure in that highly pressurized system by not being a factor. Uh, they don't play the game. Uh, and uh, they look over and see what's going on and go, well, hmm, my family screwed up as a soup sandwich, so I'm going to be over here and do a fantasy family. You know, uh, I'll relate more to things than I, uh, than I do to people. And I'll fantasize and lie about what my home life's like. You know, uh, uh, my dad's drunk all the time. I don't think he even knows my name anymore. Uh, but if you ask me, oh, my dad's a wonderful man. He's great and he's terrific and he takes me places all the time and he buys me stuff. And, you know, I'm his favorite after all, uh, which is bogus uh, and not true. Uh, but um, uh, and it's, and it's pretty sad. And uh, for these kids who are non-factors like that, uh, they, they pose a higher risk of suicide than some of the other members of the family. You can see these roles uh, uh, in action if you uh, ever go on to, uh, go on YouTube or one of your uh, old TV program sources and uh, uh, watch a few episodes of The Brady Bunch. All of The Brady Bunch is about family roles and sibling rivalry, every episode. And so you won't be disappointed in seeing how this works, how this uh, happens in action. Although uh, I couldn't rightly say that Carol and Mike were, you know, chemically dependent. I don't know what they were doing up there. But uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, another story for another class. Uh, the, 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 this, uh, the final role in that family uh, of origin is the uh, clown or the mascot, and their pressure relief too. They bring a sense of humor uh, to the family. They, they they specialize in being cute and distracting, uh, you know, for when uh, things get deep. And uh, if they make people laugh, then they're not fighting while they're laughing, right? Uh, so uh, they become class clowns too, you know, and uh, use humor to diffuse situations. Now you might not come from a family that has that perfect number. So if you know if you're an only child, you'll have to do all these roles. <laughs> you know? 
And if you only have two kids in there, you'll have to divide them out. Uh, but again, the roles are about getting through a system and about, uh, you know, making sure that you make it. Uh, and if you're a youngster, you want to make sure that the system makes it because if it doesn't, you won't. That makes sense. So, uh, and that's how uh, uh, that would work. And when you start talking uh, to uh, uh, family members and you start talking to individuals in that system and you start doing, you know, psychosocial histories and things like that and gathering information on relationships, who does the punishing, etc. In this class, I used to have um, students do a workbook and I, I still toy with that idea sometimes, you know, it's a good way to get to, uh, you know, a letter grade uh, on your own. Uh, figured into your, into your grades, but, uh, uh, there's, I flipped through it. I don't read every one. I never did read every one word for word, but I knew there were some places in there where students didn't like to write. And I go to those and see if they indeed wrote in there. And if they didn't, I got, you know, points taken off, but, uh, you can take it to the bank that when they got to chapter five and Alfred Adler and that psychosocial, uh, uh history, uh, on the family that ask them questions like, uh, uh, you know, list uh, your siblings in, uh, in age order and, um, you know, list yourself in there too, from oldest to youngest. Uh, uh, list your mother and your father and their ages in there. How did they get along? You know, are they still together? Are they still alive? Which one of your siblings was most like your father? Which one of your siblings was most like your uh, mother? Which one did you best get along with? Which one liked you the best? Uh, who did the punishing? How were you punished? Uh, and uh, people just don't want to talk about that. Uh, but this is information that's important from a, uh, from a family uh, perspective because, you know, this is the system that taught us to cut the ends off the ham and we need to understand that. We need to understand why you know, and how, and even better, how to fix it and not inflict some of the things that we suffered through, uh, on our own children, our own, our, uh, our own, uh, uh, spouses, you know, and we do do that. We put unrealistic expectations on them. See, if you loved me, uh, you would know what I wanted. I wouldn't have to tell you. As a chatty cat just came in from outside. Uh, anyway, she wants to tell me about her adventures, I guess. The, uh, made me lose my train of thought, Mona Lisa. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, so the, 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 the roles serve a useful purpose. But when we get out in the world, uh, the roles don't necessarily serve us a useful purpose. They don't. Uh, in fact, they can get in the way of us having good, healthy relationships. I want to uh, uh, do a little disclaimer here that not everyone who grows up in a chemically dependent home comes out of that really damaged. Uh, uh, human beings are remarkably adaptable. Uh, and some folks come out of uh, uh, some pretty awful things and uh, wind up being fairly well adjusted because they are adaptable and they can take care of themselves and uh, they do take care of themselves. Uh, but there are others who don't and who can't and that's, uh, uh, and that's true too. So uh, it's incumbent on us uh, to do a thorough assessment and evaluation when we're coming up with a treatment plan and deciding how to work uh, with these systems. There's also a communications model uh, that's, uh, in, uh, uh, that's um, widely uh, used in working. Well, communications uh, skills uh, fits into all of it and needs to be in all of it. Uh, we've, we do both verbal and nonverbal and a lot of it's cultural. There's some cultural issues in there too. Uh, eye contact, for instance, you know, uh, in my culture and Western culture, Western European culture, particularly, uh, if you're interested in what someone's saying, you make eye contact with them and you, you know, you nod your head and stuff like that. Uh, 
And when I get in trouble, my father would be, boy, you look at me when I'm talking to you. And so I do. Uh, some of you out there may have heard, don't you roll your eyes at me and you put them on the floor. <laughs> you know? So we can misunderstand things uh, with nonverbal cues. We also have filters to things that we hear. And those filters are cultural experiences, things we were taught, religious beliefs, moral codes, all kinds of stuff that are involved in that. Uh, and so if I have all that uh, in English being, English is a very precise language in some ways and terrifically imprecise in others. Uh, you take a word, stable, for instance, and I've used this example before. If I say, if I use the word stable, I can say, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't have a mental problem. I'm, I'm pretty stable. Most of the time, I'm really stable, you know. Uh, also, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape financially. I'm solvent. Uh, my, my finances are stable. I'm doing, I'm doing well. And I'm a, a responsible spender. I don't spend what I don't have and borrow a lot of money and stuff like that. So I'm stable in that regard. My relationship is stable. My wife and I, were very comfortable with ourselves. Our relationship is stable. Uh, excuse me. I got some hoes down the street I got to go look after. You know, you got to watch that stable. Uh, you know, so, you know, depending on the way you use it. And very often, uh, you know, you have to query people, what does it mean uh, when you say you had to discipline them? <laughs> you know, what does it mean that you had to persuade them not to do that anymore? Uh, to, find, to make sure that you're... Uh, uh, on the same page with, uh, with language. We also look at other uh, uh, body cues, you know. We can flirt with each other and never say a word. Uh, we can threaten each other and never say a word. We can express displeasure with one another and never say a word, and all of us are good at it. All of us know how that's done. So um, teaching people how to communicate and even how to fight fairly, uh, you know, uh, well, in, a, in a family system, you're going to disagree. I mean, if you don't disagree, you're not engaging. You know, uh, people who engage one another find uh, a lot of areas to agree in, but they have a lot of uh, areas where they disagree. And disagreeing with someone does not necessarily mean being disagreeable, though for some people they think it is. So we have to work uh, sometimes with family members on assertion skills, setting boundaries, not saying yes when you mean to say no, uh, and all of that good stuff. Let me go back over to my book because I forgot where we were. Let's see if I can find it. There it is. Uh, and that, and that uh, uh, applies to, uh, to the counselor, too. So all changes in human systems start with understanding and accepting things just as they are. Uh, and the family practitioner's skill in communicating understanding uh, and expressing empathy lays a foundation for an effective uh, working relationship. Conducting a relationship uh, and, and, uh, the author says, let's start with the process for co-constructing a genograms. Uh, and, and you can do this. You can, you can do these exercises with an individual client. Uh, you can also do them with, um, uh, with, a, uh, with, with a group of people, with, uh, uh, with uh, the entire family in the room, or with conjoint uh, families. You can get them started on doing a task. Uh, one, I went to a, a training with an art therapist one time, and uh, uh, she was talking about uh, uh, she would have uh, the family come in and uh, draw a, a picture together as a family. They would all work together and uh, draw a picture of their house and with them in it doing something that, uh, you know, that everyone knows that they do. Um, you know, dad's outside mowing the lawn, mom's cooking, uh, little brother's playing video games, little girl's playing with dolls, whatever. Uh, and uh, what you see as an outcome 
of uh, that uh, is to uh, see how the family perceives themselves and uh, how they draw themselves and how they uh, and how they talk about who they are in relationships to other people in this two-dimensional representation. And all of that's good and helpful and useful to understand in the families, but that's not what she was looking for. What she was looking for was how they communicate and cooperate with one another while they're doing the drawing. You know, and you can watch you can watch families coming across the parking lot and learn about it, a lot about them. Who uh, who gets out of the car first? You know, how do they arrange themselves when they're going to walk across the parking lot? Does anybody hold the door for anyone else? Who fills out the paperwork when they get into a, the waiting room? Who's watching the kids? Who's on top of that? Uh, and you get to see the family in a di in an action dynamic while it's while it's going on. So. Uh, with that in mind, if you start with the process for co-construction of a genogram, uh, you know, you start with a map of a family that comes to therapy. Uh, and I want you to go back three generations. And three generations will be uh, you, your parents, your grandparents. Or it could be you, your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. Uh, a whole lot of people in this best of all possible republics, the United States of America, can't go back any further uh, than their grandparents, or maybe their great grandparents, and I, and by the way, I'm one of them too. I mean, I've looked at uh, um, at uh, uh, some uh, uh, of that family tree stuff, you know, the uh, uh, looking for your roots thing, uh, and I know that uh, you know that um, uh, I know of family members that go back a little further and what they did and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't have a real feel uh, for how my family came forward. Uh, it seems to me that when I was born, I had grandparents, uh, and that was it, uh, and aunts and uncles, of course, and parents, uh, but it didn't go any further back than that. No great aunts, no great uncles. I did meet a great aunt once. She scared the hell out of me. She was like a really old and looked like something alive stuck into an old leather bag of some kind. But I was used to old people. I could handle that. What freaked me out is she chewed tobacco, and the tobacco she chewed was sweet twist. And she pulled it out of her apron pocket and took a plug, and I thought she was eating a little girl's pigtail. And so I tripped. <laughs> anyway, uh, it must have been significant because I remember it to this day. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Well, it is not here or there. It's trauma, <laughs> PTSD stuff. Uh, you set them down, and they start thinking, and they start talking, and they start drawing uh, this. When Mary and John have children, uh, their genogram may look like this. John, age 30. Mary, age 29. Mary, in 2010, uh, have John Jr., age 5, and Ann, age 2. And in that uh, uh, genogram, uh, they've been married for six years. Uh, taking the genogram further, and you can start right there, or you can start at the top and come down. You got his parents, her parents, uh, et cetera, right? And so there's lots of things that are used uh, in a genogram. Squares are males. Uh, uh, circles, those are really circles. They're ovals. Uh, are female, round female cornered uh, males, uh, and you put them down. You, uh, where'd it go? Uh, I guess that's all of that. I'm going to get, but uh, you can indicate deaths by Xing them out. You can uh, uh, indicate divorces by breaking the line that connects them. Uh, and uh, uh, all this is about at this stage of the game is helping the client to see the relationships in their families. Uh, and um, uh, you might be asking questions uh, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, who begat whom, and that can get very complicated. Uh, but you also look for things like alcoholism, diabetes, cancer, birth defects, uh, you know, and you find out a lot about a family by doing that. 
in the assessment process, uh, that two-dimensional representation of the family uh, is something that uh, the uh, client can put their hands on. They can see it. They can see this family uh, in itself. And some of them are real hard to do. I had a, a, a young lady who came from a family. Her parents had been married something like nine times, uh, you know, uh, to other people and three times to each other. Three of those marriages were to one another. They got married, divorced, married, divorced, and married again. Uh, and in the meantime, they were marrying other people too. So there were scads of stepsisters and brothers, and you know, I think she was her own aunt and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, you also gather information about what does each family member bring to the session? How does each person describe who or she is? What's the goals of each family member? Etc. What routine supports the uh, family member? What parts are involved in the most common sequences of the family? Uh, and these, are, uh, and you can read these as well as I can. So I'm not going to bore you with with that. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 once you begin to get this information, uh, you can start hypothesizing and sharing uh, meanings with uh, families uh, and. Chances are real good uh, if you start working with families, then you're not going to get cooperation from everyone, at least not initially. I have, uh, uh, and, and, and maybe never. I mean, uh, you know, I have uh, tried to get family members involved in counseling with a client, and they are like, uh, uh, no, I've had it. I'm through with that SOB. You do what you want with him. God bless him. But, uh, None of me, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't want to have anything to do with him anymore, and I told him so. Uh, and you do have that. Uh, when uh, family therapy is viewed as a joint or collaborative pr uh, process, uh, techniques are more uh, techniques are more important to models that are therapist as expert and in charge of making things happen. But when you're doing collaborative approaches, you're more support, your role's more supportive. And that's, a, and that's a more comfortable role for me, working with family members. Uh, planning, uh, you know, what you want to do, how you want to be, how you want to relate to one another, asking for what you want. And some of this is, a, is a, a very strange landscape. For, uh, uh, for folks. They have never been raised to ask for what they want. Uh, th they feel uh, funny sitting down and listening to people who are telling them what they want from them, uh, who are telling them how they want them to act, et cetera, and so forth, uh, you know, as well as saying, this is what I'm willing to do for you and this is how far I'm willing to go, et cetera. Uh, so, if you have family members that are coming together, uh, as important as a counselor not to take sides uh, when you're uh, working with the system, but try to, um, uh, but you know, try to uh, uh, keep a, a even hand and even balance in there, and realizing that everyone in the system, and this is another reason that family uh, counseling is so important from this perspective is everyone in an imbalanced system, everyone in a system where chemical dependency is a, or, or, or substance misuse or family violence or gambling or whatever the hell it is you're working with is a central organizing principle to that system. Everyone is affected by it, everyone. And everyone has come up with a way to cope with it this far, everyone. Uh, and so when we're going in there, sometimes what we're doing uh, is unbalancing the system. And we're not going to get a thank you, sir, from that, or thank you, well, you know. Uh, I, we just thought we were messed up till we started seeing you. <laughs> you know, you've really got us in a tailspin. Uh, so, uh, you know, be aware uh, of the stress that uh, uh, comes to a family uh, doing this. They're doing things that... Um, taking some real risks with one another, doing scary stuff with each other, and need a lot of our support. Uh, we develop, growing up in our family, uh, we develop identity 
as individuals. And now my identity encompasses a lot of my relational issues. My, I have an identity as a son. That's the relationship with the parents, right? I have an addition, uh, identity as a husband. That's the relationship with the wife. So these relationships are important in my identities. But my identity also has to do with what I do for a living. Uh, my identity has to do for how I identify uh, gender-wise, how I identify sexually, things like that. Uh, I've had some uh, experience, for instance, with uh, 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 with a kid, a young man. He declared his love for me one day, not to me, but to another person who declared it to me. You remember how civilized that kind of relationship starting was? I'll talk about that in a minute. He had not declared himself uh, to his parents. And his dad uh, was a gym rat. He, you know, was lifting weights and body sculpting and all that stuff all the time. Uh, frankly, I wondered a little bit about dad's uh, sexual orientation. Uh, and mom was, uh, you know, uh, a Deer Park Barbie. <laughs> you know, she was just, a, a, you know, shapely, uh, uh, healthy, blonde, uh, chirpy uh, mom, you know. And this kid, he's like 15 or 16 years old, and he's afraid to tell them that he's gay. Uh, so I arranged a meeting, and uh, they all came down, and he told them that he was gay. And I loved the father's reaction. He said, no kidding. <laughs> like, we didn't know that. Uh, you know, so the, it, the issue had just never been brought out in the open before, but the kid was shocked that both his parents said, we, we, we've known that for years, honey, uh, you know, and uh, so they all lived happily ever after. But it's not that way with everyone. Uh, I, you know, you're not an alcoholic. We don't have alcoholics in my family. You're, you're just, you know what, you're just an asshole. Straighten up and fly right. You know, you don't need treatment. You need to do what you're supposed to do. Grow a pair. Be a man. Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so we may find ourselves wearing our referee suit and blowing our whistle a lot in there, too. Uh, some family members, some, uh, uh, and again, there's some cultural issues with that. Some people come in and they want me uh, to tell them what to do, to basically give them a behavioral prescription. If you do this, you'll be all right. You know, um, go out there, take care of it, sin no more. Uh, others would resist that type of situation. Some people come to me and say, well, I'm willing to support Junior here, but I don't have any problems to talk to you about in that. So you can just knock it off, okay? <laughs> don't, don't, don't go trying to psychoanalyze me or anything. I'm not the one with the problem. It's this one over here. Uh, so we work within the uh, confines of what the, what the system wants, and we work where we are able to work. Uh, it doesn't um, behoove us uh, to try to make people do uh, what, um, you know, what, what we think they may need to do. Uh, I'm not going to speak a lot about ethnicity. I've talked about uh, cultural humility and being willing to learn from your clients, and that's about what you need to know about it. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's that genogram I was looking for a minute ago. This is three generations of, uh, of Stan's family. Remember, Stan is this uh, 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 client that uh, Dr. Corey follows all the way through several uh, things that he, uh, several, um, uh, all of the theories he uses on Stan. Uh, so here we are. Here's uh, Joseph and Emma. Uh, and uh, that is, where is Stan? There's Stan. That is his, I think, but, uh, paternal uh, family. Uh, Joseph and Emma were married in 1930, uh, 19. 37, uh, I thought that was a five, I can't, it's a 
kind of small on my screen. Joseph was born in 1907, Emma in 1917, and puts Joseph 10 years older than her. They were married in 37. They had three kids. Oris was the oldest, born in 1938. Frank Sr., uh, who uh, is uh, Stan's father, was born in 1940. Uh, Seth was born in 1942. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see these X's. That means death. They died. Uh, and Joseph died in 1977 of cancer. Seth was killed in 1968 in Vietnam. And Frank Sr., born in 1940, uh, is still alive. Uh, this uh, squiggly line means that there's a lot of tension in there. Uh, they're still together, uh, but uh, they have a kind of rough relationship. And uh, they were married in 1962, Frank and Angie. And uh, they had uh, uh, Matt, who was born in 1960. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. Frank was married to Judy at that time. Uh, uh, had, uh, Frank, was, Frank was married to Angie, I'm sorry. And uh, they had Judy, which was the oldest daughter, and she married Matt, and they have one son, Stan. Uh, Frank Jr., uh, and he uh, uh, he's unmarried. And Carl, who was married to Mary, and Angie, uh, and here's Stan. Uh, so uh, this legend tells you that this these blue lines here are problems with alcohol. And on the maternal side of the family, Tom, born in 1920, and Martha, 1921, both had problems with alcohol. Margie has problems with alcohol. Angie doesn't seem to have problems with alcohol, uh, the one that married Frank Sr. Uh, and uh, Carl's living with Mary, uh, and Stan is down here on his own. And then uh, when, when you get this, I mean, this is all interesting to know. It's interesting to see, too. Uh, but where it becomes useful to us is when we're talking about it. Tell me a little bit about what you know about this relationship here, or that relationship there, etc. Uh, so, and I, and I discuss that a little bit in the, in the other uh, uh, presentation that you have in this chapter uh, with the PowerPoint. Here's family therapy is acquired by uh, Gwen. And so we're really at the end of this. It wasn't a very long chapter. Uh, so I'll back out on that and come back over here. And there I am. Uh, this is where I ask any questions, but it's kind of weird because you're not going to answer me. <laughs> You know, when I'm doing these canned lectures. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. And uh, uh, and you'll get a bigger picture of this and a clearer picture of this when you take the family uh, course. This 1311 is kind of a survey of a whole bunch of different things. And so uh, you, don't, you don't get a, a, a whole lot of that uh, today, maybe, maybe later. Uh, definitely later in the family class, but uh, uh, that's all I have for you. I hope uh, I, I hope uh, none of you are uh, sleeping through this and stuff like that. Uh, and um, I'll see you all later. Bye.